give Jesus the best praise you can. Come on, put your hands together like this. We're going to reprise the end of that song one more time because this is what heaven looks like. Come on, it looks like an environment that's passionate about Jesus. It looks like an environment that isn't all white, isn't all black, isn't all quiet, isn't all loud. It's a place filled with passion. Psalm 37, verse 34 says, We're going to hope in the Lord and we're going to follow His way. When you praise God, when you worship God, He meets you in a very special way. Come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we declare this is what heaven looks like, God, I pray you pour out your spirit today in Jesus' name. Come on, let's declare this is what heaven looks like. This is what heaven looks like. This is what heaven Come on, you declare. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Come on, every voice.
God has more for us than this. And we have to bow our lives in this moment and say, God, you're king, but I'm going to keep my eyes on you. I'm not going to keep my eyes on anything else other than you. Today, if there's some pain that needs to cease, if there's some fear you need to let go of, as I pray today, would you just choose to let God be your king and not your fear be your king? Would you just choose to let that go? Come on, at home in the room, would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you today. And we believe that hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. And today as we set aside this time to worship you, God, we declare today that you're God over our fear. That you're king over our problem. God, that our situation hasn't got you shaken, God. That our situation hasn't gotten you afraid. Lord, you are sovereign and you are good. And today we fix our eyes on you. We celebrate you. We honor you for all your goodness. And today, God, we choose hope. And we will follow you. God, I thank you that you're answering our prayers even now. And God, we thank you in advance. In Jesus' mighty name, the church said amen together. Amen and amen. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Come on. The very best hand clap of praise that you can give. So good to be here with you in person worshiping Jesus. If you're with us for the very first time and you're just like, oh my gosh, this passionate worship environment. Can I just tell you, I'm even trying to turn it down a little bit for you to make you feel comfortable. We're so glad that you're here. If you're here for the first time, one hope, would you say hi to our first timers? Come on, we're glad you're here. You know, one of our values, one of our values in our church is that worship should look more like a football game than a funeral. Amen, everybody? It should look more like a, a football game than a funeral. So I just, I want you to know that if you see the exuberance and the passion, it's a desire to give God our very, very best. And so what I want to encourage you to do, always just clap along, just sing along. We even let, make the music just loud enough so nobody can see or hear you singing off key, all right? So you can, you can just sing out your hearts out. Nope, it won't bother anybody, all right? So glad to have you with us. We also have some amazing kids worship services happening down the hall. And if you've never peeked your eyes on a kids worship service, can I tell you, put some of y'all to shame in church. Come on, those kids, they got some bounce in their step when they go to church and worship. And that's down the hall. If that's new for you, that's available. Coffee in the hall. And then today is what we're just calling a little refresh Sunday. We got a little sweet tea and got a little lemonade. And you can go peach tea. You can go, you can just go straight lemonade. Come on, somebody, right? You can, you can do raspberry. That's all available. When the team told me that they were going to be putting those out there, I felt like I had a Forrest Gump moment. Y'all ever have one of these where it's like, we got Bubba shrimp, we got fried shrimp, we got, so we got every kind of lemonade you want just to, because it's hot as Hades outside right now, right? And we need a little refresh. That's available as you go today. We've got a great time prepared for you. Before we jump into the video news, that's going to tell you a little bit more about what's happening around here. I want you to take 20, 30 seconds. Would you give somebody a little fist bump? Say hi to somebody you don't know and then grab your seats. My name is Morgan. Whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online, we know that God has something special planned for you today. On your way in, one of our greeters handed you a worship guide. On the inside cover, you will find more information about the church, such as the free coffee in the hallway, our children's services that take place just down the hall, and the mother's room for moms who need to care for their young children. You will also find what we call a connection card. When you fill it out, the connection card does what it says. It connects you to the church. But don't worry, we give you the hassle-free guarantee. No one is going to call or come to your house. We simply want to send you a letter from our pastor welcoming you to One Hope. You can also fill out the connection card by texting One Hope to 94253. Also, our fall small group semester is just around the corner. If you would like to host a small group this semester, or you would like more information about small groups, simply click the link on our website or join us for small group host training each Sunday in August. If you're new to One Hope or want to learn more about the church, we would love for you to join us today for Next Steps. At Next Steps, you will have an opportunity to become a member of One Hope, take a personality and spiritual gifts assessment, and find out how God uniquely created you to make a difference. 
Next Steps takes place each Sunday at 1030 a.m. Well, that's all for me. Let's get ready for the message. One hope, would you help me by saying hello to those who are watching online? Come on, put your hands together for them. We're glad that you're joining us today. Before we jump into the message, I want to echo the news just for a moment and talk about small groups. You know, we believe that, uh, that real life change happens in the context of relationships. And so when you develop real and meaningful relationships, that's where you grow. That's where you'll change. That's where you'll actually see God answer your prayers. And we are not a church with groups. We're a church of groups. And so we've got lots of opportunities that's all starting next Sunday. And so I want to encourage you to look for those as they're coming. But I also want to encourage you maybe to hope host a group. If you've never hosted one and you say, well, I'm not a leader. Well, listen, if you can put out Doritos and a Coke, you can host a small group, everybody. Anybody here like Doritos? I like, I love some Doritos today. And a Coca-Cola with those two. Those two things are amazing to me. You don't have to plan anything else. How many of y'all know this, ladies? When you gather around a table with some fresh Doritos and a Coke, that some talking's gonna happen, right? And as soon as that talking starts to happen, that's where life change happens. You just share your life. And so you don't have to be qualified. You don't have to be perfect. We have a little host training just so that you know how to, how to put out the, the Doritos straight, okay? We, we got a little host training just to make sure you know where to put things. Here's what I want to invite you to do to remember that if you're going through life only seeing people of faith one hour a week or one and a half hours a week, you're missing out on the relationships that God really wants you to have, and you're also missing out on some of the life change and the growth and the fun you could have. And so, I want to invite you to host one or find one. It's all starting next weekend. Today, today we're in part three of our series. We've simply titled Blueprints because we believe that there is a real blueprint for our lives. We have not hidden this idea. We've been about this from the very beginning and that we believe the Bible is the blueprint for our lives. Some of y'all maybe even remember back in those Sunday school days, we had a little, little acrostic, B-I-B-L-E. We got the basic instructions before leaving earth, all right? So that, that's what the Bible is. We believe the Bible, that was funny, y'all didn't even laugh. It's okay, it's all right, y'all gonna catch up. I just need y'all to know that today's message is already in my mind, running at about 110 miles an hour, okay? It's way up here. Y'all are around 65, you need to catch up, all right? It's going to be one of those kinds of days to take some notes because I am very, very passionate about today's message because the blueprint for this area of our lives is so clear out of God's word. God is an intelligent designer. He put us together on purpose. There are no accidents in this room. God has you here for a reason. Our key verse for the series, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, it's going to be on every single screen. It says, as, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones are being built, we just say it out loud all together, being built into a spiritual house. We believe that God has given us a blueprint for our spiritual house, what we're supposed to look like, how it's going to be. And I love, as we sang a little bit earlier, this is what heaven looks like. This is what freedom looks like. When you get to heaven, it ain't going to be all white, y'all. It ain't going to be all black. It's not going to be all brown. It's not going to be all quiet. It's not going to be all loud. Heaven is going to look like a congregation like this. Can I get an amen from somebody, right? It's going to look different. 
And so what we've been coming back to is that we're building a spiritual house. Week one, we said we're going to be a house of prayer. And we kicked off prayer week. Seven days straight, we prayed and sought God. And can I just encourage you, would you keep praying for us? Pray for our future building that God will provide. Would you pray for Haiti? Would you pray for Afghanistan? Would you pray for the pandemic just a little bit, right? Come on. Delta virus needs to go back to hell in Jesus' name. The Delta variant. I know I said it wrong, okay? But y'all know what I'm talking about. It's time for that to go somewhere else. You know, I'm just, I'm done with it. How about you? I want to do my part, but I'm done with the devil trying to ruin our lives with this kind of craziness, right? I know, I know. I need to stop moving on, all right? Week two, week one was a house of prayer. Week two was a house of worship. And we really challenged ourselves to kind of get out of these traditional ideas that worship has to be kind of right over left and quiet. And we challenged ourselves to to express our worship because God is worthy of our highest praise. Those are still available. If you'd like to watch them online, you can watch the full service worship and everything is included today. Today, we're going to talk about a spiritual family. We're going to talk about that God's blueprint for our lives is to be a part of a family. There are no individuals. If you go all the way back to the beginning, God looked at Adam. He said, Adam, you're not good by yourself. And I hate to break it to you, man or woman in the room, you're not good by yourself. I do find, ladies, it's amusing that, you know, God put Adam in the garden and, you know, it's like a beautiful place, but, you know, Adam didn't know what to eat, Adam didn't know what to drink, Adam didn't know what to wear, right? Adam didn't know what to do with just about anything in his life, and so God gave him a beautiful woman. Ladies, amen right there, right? Got him a beer. So, so God looked at us and said, man, man, you are bad by yourself, but if I give you a woman, you'll be amazing, right? I think that's great. Some of you ladies are, don't know if you should laugh. I'm serious. I'm serious. I've been married uh, 18 years and I'm much better, I'm much better and nicer because she is in my life. My sister said a real amen over there. She's like, oh yeah. Before Amber showed up, he was a jerk, you know? You know, do you know the very first, the very first institution that God created, it wasn't the government, it wasn't the military, The very first institution God created wasn't Walmart. Some of y'all are that young. It wasn't Amazon. Like the the very first institution created by God was the family. And and I love it. It wasn't just an individual solo by themselves. He said, no, no, no. We're going to put you together and we're going to create something special. And in that environment, you're going to affect the rest of the world. It'll take you to the very first chapter of the very first book of your Bible, Genesis chapter 1 and 27. It says, so God, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. I just think it's very, very clear, no confusion there. Then God blessed them. How many of y'all want some God blessings in your life? I, I love, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Young families, it's time to grow the church. All right, I'm just telling you, a little, little side note. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the crazy animals that are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, social media, all the crazy animals that scurry along the ground. I want you I want you to govern and reign. Would you say those two words? Govern and reign. Now, do you notice he didn't say U.S. government? He didn't say politicians. He didn't say, he said, no, no, man and woman, the beginning of the family, I need you to govern all of this. And I want you to reign over it. The first institution of authority was given to us to govern and to reign. Now, you'll notice that that's really clear in Scripture, but you'll notice that the very first thing that the enemy did, come on, that little snake, he slithered his way into the garden, and what did he do? He tried to tear apart God's institution of authority. He tried to break it down, and the first attack kind of looked like this. Take some notes with me. It'll be on screen. The first attack, the, the enemy just tried to diminish the importance of family. I mean, you, you, you don't need anybody else. You're good by yourself. 
And can I tell you, in my experience, the people who have stayed by themselves the longest are the people who really get the weirdest, all right? Can I just side note, can I say that? Do y'all know that every third person God created a little different, right? And if you look to the left and they're okay, and you look to the right and they're okay, you could be the one, all right? It could be you. We, we all are a little strange, but the first thing the enemy did was let's diminish, let's diminish the family. You're okay just by yourself. And listen, I understand the sentiment of like being comfortable with who you are, being comfortable with the person God made you. So I'm not talking about your worth or your value. I'm talking about diminishing the fact that God brought you into this world in a family, that you couldn't get here by yourself. God needed a man and woman to get into an intimate relationship to produce life in this world. The first attack was let's just diminish the value of this. The second one was to divide the family. Let's divide, let's divide, let's divide to the best of our ability. And this is the enemy's plan today. Let's divide the family in every possible way. Divorce has become so rampant, so much so that we're, we're teaching divorce to 12 and 13 year olds. And they say, what are you talking about? Well, we're teaching them to go and try out as many as possible until you can finally figure out which one's the best one for you. At 13, we're teaching people how to practice divorce rather than practice the plan that God has for your life. I told you I was at 110. Y'all are getting about 72 right now, all right? Need to catch up a little bit. Need to, need to come a little higher. Just, just relax, just breathe. Yeah, I'm going there. Think, think about our culture and how we've had this kind of over-sexualized environment, try everybody out, do everything that way. Can I tell you, if you go with God, God's plan, and you don't try anybody out, you just stick with God's plan, and you get married, and it's your first time, can I just tell you, it's the best sex in the world. The only problem now today is that we've gotten outside of God's institution, God's plan, and we've done all these other things, and now we're comparing people to people that aren't even real. We've got this mindset, and the enemy is using it to divide families. We're getting married with the mindset that I can get out just as quickly as I got in, just like when I was 14, and it didn't work out. Listen, that's not God's plan. The enemy has diminished the idea of the family. He's doing everything he can to divide. And culture says that it's a 50-50 shot. Your marriage will work. Can I tell you, if you find faith and you go to some premarital counseling, your odds of survival in marriage go up to 90% just because you had common faith and you got some counseling on the way in. Listen, we're not diminishing the family and we certainly aren't going to keep dividing the family. The last we see is, this third attack is very prevalent right now, is the redefining of the family. And we're trying to define it something other than what Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28 defines. And today I just want to come back that if God created the institution, God defines the institution. I know some of y'all are nervous right now, you pastor, you pastor, you're not being politically correct. I have never been politically correct. I'm trying to be biblically correct. Amen, everybody? And listen, if politics come along every once in a while, like a broke clock can be right twice a day, right? If, the, if politics were lined up with the Bible every once in a while, then we'll be on the same road together, right? But listen, as long as the political world is diverging from the biblical world, I will hold the line. How about you? We're gonna hold the line. Come on, three people over. If you're gonna clap, might as well do it. So the first institution God, God intended... And there is a mass attack. Let me just take a minute. Let me just read you some statistics about the family and what has happened as the nuclear family has broken down. And some of you may say, Pastor, statistics really right now? Yeah, I get it. I get it. What is it? There's a president famously said that there are statistics. Uh, there, there, there are lies. There are damn lies. And there are statistics. Okay, everybody? Like, I, I understand. Yes, I did say that in church. Okay, breathe. When the nuclear family breaks down, all of these things increase. I won't even give you the percentages for all of them. They just, they increase rapidly and to a, to a level that is painful and we're seeing it all around us. When the nuclear family breaks down, problems with mental health go crazy. Do you know that calls to depression hotlines are still up 400% in the last 18 months? People who are struggling with depression, anxiety, and fear in our society, 400%. That's crazy. Uh, another, alcohol and drug abuse, when the nuclear family breaks down, shoots through the roof. 
Alcohol sales in the last year up 30%. Drug overdoses that ended in death are up 30%. 93,000 people died last year because of drug overdoses in our nation. It's a problem. These are all rooted in the breakdown of the family because we are called to govern and to reign. But because it's been diminished, because it's been divided, because it's been redefined, the family isn't doing what we need to be doing. Now, I know this doesn't sound encouraging. We're going to end with encouraging. Okay, we're going to end there. But let me give you a few more. Problems with relationships just go through the roof. Lower educational attainment. So we don't get smarter. We go the other direction when family breaks apart. Single parenting goes through the roof. Right now, we're at least 25% of children are growing up in a single parent environment. And that is the leading cause of poverty in our nation. Fatherlessness increases. And in every environment where there isn't a father present, there is an increase in adolescent pregnancy and crime. You don't have to look far. And you can Google this and you'll find a hundred sites that echo the same thing over and over and over and over again. We're seeing the fruit of a broken family in our society. This has been the enemy's plan since the beginning to diminish, to divide, to redefine so that ultimately he can divide and conquer so that he can divide and destroy what God has brought to this earth. And all I'm saying to you today is if you're tired of seeing the statistics, what we need to come back to is not being angry at the statistics. We've got to get back to the blueprint of the family. We got to get back to not diminishing, but rather elevating the power and the importance of the family. And I know some of you, you immediately said, Pastor, you just brought up all of my pain in one moment. Can I just say time out? Welcome. Welcome to the environment because we all have messed up families. This has been the enemy's plan. There isn't a one of us that hasn't been affected by divorce. There isn't a one of us that hasn't been affected by some level of abuse. There isn't a one of us that hasn't had to deal with the ramifications. It's not just you. You're not the only one. That's what the enemy wants you to think. It's, it just happened to you and everybody else in these nice clothes. They grew up with a perfect family. It doesn't exist. Perfect families don't exist. Think about it. God the Father was, was a perfect father and he had perfect children he put in the garden and they still screwed it up, y'all. I'd love to be mad at Adam and Eve, but if it was you and me, we probably would have messed it up too, Right? The issue isn't that there are problems. The issue is is that we're not solving the problems with the blueprint. That we're not coming back to the plan that God has for us. And unfortunately, the brokenness that we see in our individual families, we always say that God's answer to that individual brokenness is to put you in a bigger family that he called the church. That's always something we say around here, but can I tell you, in many church environments, we've kind of gone the other direction. I'll put it on screen. You want to see this line, the church has become a reflection of a broken family rather than the spiritual family of healing that God intended. What has happened is we've just said, well, this is what I have. This is what we are. We're going to bring that. And and so now we've got church environments that are creating people who are distant, but they're still in church. Almost every year for the past 10 years, some 7,000 churches in the United States are closing their doors. You know what that creates? That creates a lot of division. That creates a lot of spiritual orphans. That creates a lot of brokenness. It creates a lot of distrust because the enemy's plan is to divide God's family, to diminish God's family so that it's unimportant, so that we can redefine it as something other than what God intended. But can I just tell you today that we've been trying to push back against that. 7,000 are closing a year. We're opening 4,000 new churches a year. Come on, we got some friends over here. Got, got Pastor Tori. Wave your hand over here, Pastor Tori. Wave your hand at me real good. Pa- pa- plant the church. Plant the church on the West Bank. Proud of you, man. So excited for your family. Listen, what do we do in the city? It's not all about One Hope Church. It's about the church, right? And so we've planted multiple churches because it's going to take more than us to change this city. But instead of reflecting a broken family, what should we be? 
We should be reflecting the blueprint of a spiritual and healthy family. And we should be opposing the onslaught of the craziness around us. That's the statistics. Let me talk for just a moment about how it feels. When you grow up in brokenness, the first thing that happens is you begin to feel insufficient. You have this feeling that you're not good enough. It's one of the most prevalent things that me as your pastor that I deal with. I can't tell you how many people that I sit with that ultimately a healthy spiritual family, both natural and spiritual, would have solved 80 to 90% of the issues. But there is this insufficiency that creeps in when the family has broken down. That's how it feels. Just, I just don't feel like I'm good enough. The second feeling is this feeling of insignificance. I'm just, I, I'm not important. They don't need me. I don't need to be here. No one would miss me. There's nothing further from the truth today. You're here for a reason. You're significant to God. You are significant to us. You are not insignificant in this world. There, the Bible says that God has you here for such a time as this. And the world is desperate for you to kind of get out of that insignificance and find who you are. You're a person of value. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. The third feeling that we all end up with is with this feeling of insecurity. We start going around. Now we feel unsure of, there's just, I'm just, I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure about God. I'm not sure about science. I'm not sure about this. We've lost faith in so much of our institutional environments. Can we just come back to having faith in the family that's in front of us? We, we feel this, ah, I wonder what it'd be like to feel secure. Can I just tell you today that my security isn't in the success of the government? And my security isn't in the size of my bank account. And my security isn't whether the, the naysayers on the Instagram like what I said or didn't say. My security is in the blueprint. My security is in the value of what he said and who he said. We all, we all have this insufficient, insignificant, very just overwhelmed, insecure feel. We're all carrying it at some level. And today, can I just tell you, I sense the power of God in my heart and life to break that off of us, that we would be the men and women that God intended us to be. That we would walk with confidence with our held head held high, our chest poking out. Come on, you can walk by the mirror and say, I'm smart enough, I'm good enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? You can, you can have some confidence regardless of when someone said, you're, oh, you're, you're the redheaded stepchild. No, you're not. Like God's up in heaven playing duck, duck, goose, y'all. He's not doing that. There are two, two recorded conversations from God the Father to Jesus the Son in Scripture. There are two times that God the Father spoke a resounding word that not only did Jesus hear, but the other people around Jesus said, oh my, oh my God. <laughs> like Matthew chapter 3, the first we find at the baptism of Jesus. I do find it interesting for some of you who are maybe on the fence about going public with your faith that Jesus, as a 30-year-old man, was baptized, the Bible says, to fulfill all righteousness. Please don't be embarrassed or be ashamed of your faith in Jesus Christ. Go all in, go all out, make it public. Matthew chapter 3 and 16 says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, would you read it aloud? Come on, every voice. A voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. There was this resounding voice. My son, I love him. Boy, I'm pleased with you. You're doing a good job. 
I even imagine that, that God the Father was like, you know, wasn't really a big fan of that water into wine one, but I still love you, son, right? I, 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 you know, I like this miracle, but I'm not so sure about that miracle. You know? but, but he just said, this is my son whom I love. I am well pleased. The second conversation is what the Bible describes as the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John walked with Jesus up to a mountain, and when they got to the mountain, Moses and Elijah and Jesus were there. Jesus was there in the flesh, but they all began to transfigure. The Bible says that they began to shine with the glory of God, and the disciples were kind of overwhelmed with like, hey, should we create something special for Moses, for Elijah, and for Jesus? And God the Father begins to speak to elevate Jesus above Moses and Elijah. We find it in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5. He says, wow, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, would you read it again? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased and I love yet. Listen to what he says. Like, listen to him. Like, could, could you just pay attention to what he says? God the Father says three things to Jesus. And I think it touches on the three issues that we all have in our lives. I think it's what we need to hear from our spiritual family today. Here's the first thing he said. He said, this is my son. This is where God the Father gave him acceptance. And when you know acceptance, you feel secure. When someone says, hey, they're with me. All of a sudden you feel secure. When you walk into an environment you've never been before and you don't know anybody and, and that girl you've been dating or that guy you've been dating introduces you and they say, this is one of those telling conversations, right? It's one like, uh, when they say, this is my friend, you're kind of like, oh, we're still at friend status, right? But when they claim you and say, girl, you my girlfriend, right? <laughs> what happens? Status just went up another level. Why? Because there is public acceptance in who they are. I always love to tease couples when they introduce themselves and I say, thank you for, for publicly claiming them. I appreciate that, right? It's important because, listen, we got, some, we got some eligible men and women around here. If you go walking around alone for too long, somebody's going to pick you up, all right? <laughs> Just trying to help you all out. Why do you think we do that meet and greet every day? Why, every Sunday. Turn to your neighbor, give him a little fist bump. And what's your number? <laughs> what's your name, delicate? <laughs> Second thing he said to him, he said, this is, this is my son. I claim you. I accept you. He said, whom I love. He gives affection. And when you see affection, right? When you see it, you feel significant. When you see somebody come run towards you, give you a big kiss on the cheek and say, oh, I'm so glad to see you. Versus the other, when someone walks in and they give everybody some doubt, but they skip you, all of a sudden you feel like, well, what about me? I mean, am I chopped liver over here? Like, can you not hug a brother, right? Can you not, can you not go beyond this? This is my son and whom I love. Third thing he says he says, I am well pleased. Jesus got public affirmation from God the Father. And when you hear affirmation, you feel sufficient. All of a sudden, when someone says, man, when you do that, it's amazing. We all need acceptance. We, we all need affection and affirmation. Inc. Magazine recently did a study that basically came back and discovered that every human being needs those same exact three things that we're longing for them. And can I tell you where you were supposed to discover it first was in your family. But because of the diminishing, because of the dividing, because of the redefining, all of us are now going to and fro looking for someone that would just accept us. And I want you to know that in this spiritual family, regardless of your history, your heritage, or the color of your skin, you are accepted as a child of God. Do you have to get right to get to God? No, you got to get to God to get right with God. And we accept you right where you are. But I promise you this, if you got some messed up junk in your life, I'm not going to leave you there. I will accept you just as you are. And I will affirm better behavior out of you. I will expect you to rise up and become the sons and daughters of the Most High God that he has called you to be. 
two conversations, and God speaks to the issue. If we fast forward a little bit of time, you find the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul is realizing that the enemy's trick hasn't changed. He did it in the garden. He's been doing it since the garden. Here we are. God, the enemy is still doing it, still trying to destroy the institution that God said should govern and reign. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and 14, Paul says, he says, I'm writing this to you not to shame you. Can I just stop there? Today's message isn't to shame any of us. We're all in this together. It's not you and, oh, pastor, you had, no, no, no. It's all of us. And I love that he says, I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Can I just, I don't think I'd be corrupting the text to say, You do not have many families. For in Christ Jesus, I became your family through the gospel. For in Christ Jesus, I became a spiritual father to you. He says, listen, there's this tension. There's some problem. There's some shame that's crept into all of our lives. And what we need, what we need to understand is that there are all sorts of guardians out there. But what you need more than that is a spiritual family to bring healing to your life. And then I just love how he echoes Jesus. The very next two verses, he says, therefore, I urge you to do what I do. So I urge you to imitate me, look like me. For this reason, I have sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. Does that sound familiar to you all? Hey, I'm sending you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful to the Lord. And he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. I'm sending you my son to remind you that we're a family. Because though we got lots of teachers and guardians, right now what this generation needs is regardless of your age, they need someone to be a father and a mother. And you say, well, they're they're not my blood. So what? What? You married somebody that wasn't your blood, hopefully. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Forgive me. Some things aren't planned. They just come out. Let me say it to you this way. An intimate family relationship brought you into this world. And it's an intimate family relationship that will heal your broken world. See, you started with an intimate family relationship. And what you need to bring healing to this area of your life is not to hide and pretend, but to open. To be honest. Now, I know that immediately feels like... I don't know if I could do that, Pastor. I don't know if I could do this like public confession thing. Well, I'm not saying that we start on Sundays walking in saying, lied yesterday. (laughs) Watched a terrible movie. Shouldn't 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 have watched that. I realized that that would create some awkwardness, wouldn't it? But there is an intimate relationship with Jesus that we need. One John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, you are brought into this world through an intimate relationship and what will change your world the most is an intimate relationship with Jesus. But beyond Jesus, you've got to get into other intimate relationships where you allow people to say, hey, you're my son, you're my daughter, you're a person I love. I'm well pleased with what you're doing. I, I'm so proud of you. How would it change your world if you would allow someone who genuinely cared for you to look you in the eyes and to speak these words to you and you would ingest them and let them override the insufficiency and you would let them override the insecurity and you would begin to stand up and be the people that God intended you to be. 
James 5 and 16 describes that intimate relationship with people this way. He says, he said, listen, you confess your sins to God for forgiveness, but he says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The healing that we're looking for in our society isn't going to come from an institution. It's going to come from trusting the person in front of you. It's going to become it's going to be you trusting that God has placed you here for a reason. I'm calling us today. I know it's kind of a heavy message. I know I'm taking you on a long ride from statistics into a deep dive into the word of God. But I'm trying to convince you today that the blueprint for the family, it still exists. And you can live with some, just some fire and some passion inside of you because of what God said about you. So how do we do this? I'm really glad you asked. I want to give you three things, okay? I want three practical things to do. Number one, I want you to start seeing people as they could be, not as they are. This is a big one right now. What would it be like if we started seeing something better in someone? I like to say it this way. How about we don't point out their sin and we point out their potential, everyone? What if we set our eyes on what God has called you to be and what you could be rather than set our eyes on what you did that one time? What if we saw their potential? Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Sometimes when you don't even see some evidence, you got to start seeing it in someone else. I think this is a big deal because we focus our eyes on people's failures too much. And today, I just want to call out in you what I see, that you're image bearers. What does that mean? You bear the image of God. I love this. This is important that scripture says this because a giraffe does not look like God. Amen, everybody? A zebra does not look like God. Come on. <laughs> Neutral rats don't look like God. Can I get a better amen in South Louisiana, right? They don't look like God. You and I, we are image bearers, and I see in you the image of God. I see the remnants of God's grace and his blueprint, his hand upon your life. I see it in you. The second thing we have to do, number two, you have to roll that back, is you got to say what you see. Too many of us, we think that we've already said it. Well, I told them I loved them, but that was back in 64, okay, everybody? It's time to tell them one more time. It's time to like say it one more time. The, the greatest problem with communication is the illusion that you've already said it, right? What if you just would say it again? You need to see something in people and say it to them. I never leave my children. I never leave my spouse. I never leave people that are in my family without saying, hey, I love you. I know those words in some environments are hollow and shallow, but they're not to me. They're not to me. Listen, I, even today, uh, leaving the house, hey, I love you because the last words that are gonna be remembered from me to my children and my spiritual family is, hey, you're mine. I love you. And I'm pleased with who you are. You're going to, man, the potential, the, the things that God has for you, they're amazing. Romans 4 and 17, he says, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom we believe. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Sometimes you have to just see it in them and begin to call it out in them. You have to see it in them and you have to call it out in them. This is what we do. You see potential. Boy, I see your potential. I see your potential. We started One Hope Church together. I see your potential. Do you look around this room, Trinita, and see your potential and buying into a diverse environment when you were the very first Almost the very first black person to say, I'll, I'll follow this white crazy pastor, right? <laughs> right? You saw the potential in me, and I saw the potential in you. And you look around the room, there's something that's growing. There's something that's vibrant. Why? Because we started calling it out. 
Come on, it was nearly seven years ago. We didn't wait for a pandemic to start loving people who are different. It was seven years ago that we said, if you look different than me, I love you. It was seven years ago I said, regardless of your history, your heritage, or the color of your skin, which is on a video at the beginning of every single service that 90% of you have never seen because you might not have been early to church, all right? It's not a Sunday that we don't say it. It's not a Sunday that we don't say it. And I still think there's more work to be done, y'all. But I see it and I'm saying it. I think about my father and mother when they were young Christians and I was just in the womb and they felt like that God spoke to them to name me Joshua Joseph. And they read somewhere in the Bible, Jeremiah chapter one, by the way, that said, I've called you. I saw you in the womb and I declare that you would be a prophet to the nations. All my young life, they kept saying, you're a prophet to the nations. Can I tell you how confusing that was for me? Until I figured out that a prophet wasn't a weird person, right? I understood the nation's part. The other part, God has called me to be a voice of one crying in this generation. Make ready, make way for the Lord. I, I'm the voice. That's all I am. I'm an example to go first, to lead the way. You got to see it and you got to say it. Can I say something? Hear these words. What you did that one time doesn't define you for all time. Your biggest mistake isn't a scarlet letter that you're walking around. That's what the enemy wants. That's a lie. You're more than a conqueror. You're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. God has a plan. You're a prophet to the nation right now. We need some more prophets. We need some more voices for God. Think about the Old Testament. God found Abram and said, no, you're not going to have one child. I'm going to call you Abraham, father of nations. And Sarai, you've had nothing but bitterness because you've been barren for over 90 years of your life without child. But I'm going to change your name to Sarah and you're going to have a child and you're going to be the mother of all those nations, right? You're going to be, when people see you, they're going to call you blessed. And instead of bitter, they're going to see the sweetness of God on you. I think about Jacob, whose name meant deceiver and supplanter. God said, no, 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 prince of God. Hey, no, no, not a deceiver, prince of God. You're not a liar. You're not broken. You're whole. Think about our team. Think about the people in this room. Think about the leaders that God has placed here. I think about Shalina when she was just 15 years old. She's our worship leader. She stumbled into our youth group in St. Charles Parish right down the bayou. She came in and we had this thing happening. I used to sing and play music. Can y'all imagine that, right? I still fancy myself a singer sometimes. But y'all know better, don't you? But I saw a gift in Shalina. We saw a gift so much so that she followed my wife to the same college and went and got a music degree and taught music for years until we planted One Hope Church and became the worship leader here because we saw something and we said it. And today you and I are blessed, not because I'm perfect. If you talk to Shalina, she's got a family messed up just like all of ours, but she became a part of something bigger. You need to see people differently. You need to say what you see. And number three, we've got to get started, y'all. We got to get started. So it's time, it's time for you to raise your voice to start that small group and find two other people and see something in them and say what you see. I say you need to find two more people because if you find one, two persons a date, three persons a small group, okay? That's what I just want you to know. It's a small group. You got to get to three, two, it's shady, okay? That's all I'm saying. They need you to see it. We need you to say it. Romans 1 and 10. It's our last verse. He said, I pray, I pray now that at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. Because I long to see you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you, Jess, a spiritual gift. Jackie, that I might make you stronger. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged, Ronnie. 
that we might encourage each other's faith together. Church, our highest calling is the growth and development of our spiritual family. And I'm committed. I'm committed. How about you? Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, right now, by the authority you've given me as a lead pastor of One Oak Church, I stand in authority right now. And I come in agreement with every person under the sound of my voice to break insecurity. Intercessors, just pray with me just for a moment. Press in. Press in just for a moment. I I break insecurity in Jesus' name. I break the lie that you aren't sufficient or good enough in Jesus' name. I tear down this insignificance that's causing you to do things with your body and your mind and your life because you feel of no value today. I, I break it in Jesus' name and I declare that you are loved and that you're a part of this family and that God has a place for you. And I stand in direct opposition to the enemy that wants to diminish your value, that the enemy that wants to divide our relationship, I stand in direct opposition and I I define the family the way God defined it. And today, in Jesus' name, I thank you that every lie of the enemy is being broken. And God, we're ingesting hope and faith and life and family. And today, every time the enemy speaks a lie, I reject it in Jesus' name. And I receive hope and I receive life. And God, today we will walk in your authority in Jesus' name. Just stay focused, every head bowed and every eye closed. Today, if you're under the sound of my voice and you don't know God, you've never given your life to God, you've never followed him, you've never submitted everything to him, today's your day. This is your moment. Don't be distracted. Jesus will accept you with one prayer of faith. Whisper these words. I won't embarrass you. I won't ask you to stand or come to the front. Would you whisper these words? Say, Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life on my own? God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name. The church said amen together. Amen and amen. Would you celebrate those decisions? Come on, honor them. So proud of you. Listen, in seven years, there hasn't been a Sunday where somebody hasn't given their life to Jesus. If that's you today, don't be embarrassed. Would you text my decision to 94253? Or would you fill out one of the connection cards that's in the seat back? I would love to know about your decision because I want to send you a letter welcoming you to the family. I want to send you a letter saying, hey, here's some next steps because the most important thing we do as a family is adopt more family members. Amen, everybody? The most important thing we do is make a way for people who aren't here yet to find this as a home. So take a moment. Let us know about your decision. Stop by the information table and grab a free gift from us if you'd like. Also, if you came prepared to worship God with giving, go ahead and get that out and ready. Y'all know the drill. You can give in person the buckets or you can give digitally. I want you to know that we are believing that God is providing a physical home for us. And I'm hopeful your faithfulness in giving is setting us up so as God provides, we can pull the trigger and we can make a difference. I'm hopeful that that's happening real soon. By the way, I've got some insider information. I think it's happening real soon. Okay, everybody? I I believe God's, God's making a way for us. Please be faithful and know that your faithfulness is making a difference. Would you stand with me? Prayer team, make your way. Remember, communion's available. Prayer team will be down front to pray for you. Let's pray over our giving today. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, as we give to you today, God, as we come to you with our whole hearts, I pray, God, that you have blessed our financial lives so that we can continue to make a difference, so that we can continue to invest in this community. God, we thank you for it now. In Jesus' mighty name, we all shouted amen. Amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday.